ahead and get started because um, I just wanted to make a few comments before the slides come up. And uh, I made some notes. So uh, my mission has been for quite some time quality care the first time. That's quality care in the, in the family physician's office. It's quality care at the neurologist's office. It's quality care in the ER. It's quality care in uh, a surgeon's office, a neurosurgeon's office. Um, so this talk I presented, this, my mission uh, is to address the care, the surgical care of Chiari syringomyelia. We've talked a lot about associated disorders that we have to be very conscious of, obviously. But if the treatment is going to be Chiari syringomyelia, how do we make it one surgery? So I'm going to share with you what we've learned over the past 20 years in over 800 uh, surgeries for Chiari malformation. We're now specializing in revision surgery, and we need to get beyond having to have revision surgery. So that's my goal. Um, and uh, we've already touched on these uh, multiple associated disorders here. Uh, the first thing, in it's on a different computer. Some of this is going to come a little different. But first of all is we have to make sure it's Chiari. And there are at least two conditions that look like Chiari but are not Chiari. And if you have a Chiari operation for those, you might do worse. So what are the two conditions? Uh, this is a 38-year-old woman who presented with headaches, vision, dizziness, posterior faucet two years ago before she came to see us. Uh, this is her follow-up scan and she had no improvement whatsoever. And when you look at her uh, posterior fossa area, it's actually well decompressed. If you look at this brain closer and closer, it looks tighter and tighter as you look at it. That is a tight brain. This is idiopathic intracranial hypertension. It can push the tonsils down, the surgeon can do uh, decompression, some actually deteriorate, um, significantly. Uh, fortunately, many don't. So we have to be aware of this condition. Uh, in our uh, institute, everyone is screened for uh, health measures. We've just picked three key ones, hemoglobin A1C, vitamin D. We just looked at our recent numbers. Over 70% of people we see in our clinic have low vitamin Ds. Uh, the lowest recently was a 10. And CRP, high sensitivity CRP, is a measure of inflammation in your brain. And inflammation can cause cognitive decline, Parkinson's disease, depression, small vessel disease. There's an extreme length of symptoms that it can cause. So if you think it's the Chiari malformation, it may or it may not be. So we screen everyone and have developed a wellness program. This is only one component, but the key issue is anti-inflammation. And again, sometime in the future, maybe we'll talk about that. Today, we're going to talk about Chiari syringomyelia and revision surgery. But if, again, you don't want to operate on someone who doesn't have Chiari malformation. So let's look here. And I'm sure most of you are used to looking at these sagittal MRIs. And you can see the foramen magnum, you can see the cerebellum, you can see the tonsils are badly herniated, the brain stem is stretched, okay? This is after surgical treatment. The um, brain stem looks much more relaxed. The tonsils are way up here. Things are really happy. But if you look closely, there is no Chiari surgery that's been done. How did this person go from here to here? This looked like Chiari. But instead, the surgeon appropriately treated a spinal fluid leak, minimally invasive. This is the brain going down the sink. So if you've got a leak, your tonsils can herniate. If somebody goes in and does a posterior fossa decompression, you may worsen. So CSF hypotension has to be uh, considered low pressure. Uh, so those are two that look like it. Uh, avoiding surgical failure, first of all, what are our goals? We have to think about that. We want to restore CSF flow in this area. And I'm sure I don't need to point out, or maybe I should, this is a very stretched medulla. The tonsils can catch on the tubercles of the back of the spinal cord and stretch it with each pulsation. 
So we obviously want to relieve neural compression and deformation. This is a very abnormal looking mandola. So those are our goals. How do we achieve those? My overriding principle, and I think could help a lot of us, if you will, or hopefully all of us, is to think of the choke point. This is a choke point disorder. The crowding is here. We know people can have small posterior fossas, abnormal angles, et cetera, but the treatment, the pathology, the block is at the neck of the funnel. So this is the choke point. Surgery has to address the choke point. We want to take this deformity with a long brain stem, stretch, uh, narrow, uh, herniated tonsils below C1 and treat it to that, and change it to that. So how do we do that? So avoiding failure means performing each of these steps in a proper manner. I'm going to tell you what has worked for us, but we all know we're going to we learn from each other. So hopefully the science will continue to progress and others I'm sure have other contributions uh, that they can share. I'm not going to go through all seven. I've presented this uh, in two conferences this year, one at the Southern Neurosurgical Society, the other at Neurosurgery of the Rockies, and I plan to continue to do so. Um, I'm just going to take you through these four, because this otherwise would be a very lengthy talk. The extent of the bony decompression is crucial. This is the best illustration I've found in the literature to what I think works. And that is a decompression that is as wide, um, close to as wide as possible of the foramen magnum. Extending up two and a half to three centimeters depending on the pathology, not taking all this bone here. And I'm going to show you some of those causes. This is what some of the books say. You need to do that or you need to do that. So there's no agreement. If you wonder why so many neurosurgeons do different things, there's no agreement. So I've categorized these people that come into me that have failed their surgery or have ongoing symptoms, obviously is what I mean. This is an over decompression and this is an under decompression. There's something uh, Goldilocks in between this. And let's look at some of the, and this is both. This is an over decompression, but an under decompression at the choke point. The choke point is here. I don't know how that projects for you, but it's still crowded. This was not made wide enough. These could have been trimmed. And then an under decompression. This is a foramen magnum. This 29-year-old with the current symptoms. She uh, has no real space behind the tonsils. The CT shows just a little over two centimeters of decompression. Just trimmed a little of C1 in the skull base. Lying down, face down. The head is on this end. The spine is on that end. The width of the decompression is about three centimeters. The um, length of the decompression may be 11, uh, 12 millimeters in this case, so very limited decompression. Go back in on the second operation, open up the dura, open up the arachnoid, uh, so in, so in a pericranial graft. I know other grafts work, but what has worked for me for, again, pretty close to 20 years is your own pericranium harvested just above um, the, uh, the area of work, if you will. This is the post-op. We'll talk a little bit about this plate. Actually, I think I've trimmed that out, but I reconstruct most fossas. We're trying to rebuild and we, I wish I had time. This is another one, uh, very minimal bony decompression, uh, about 11 millimeters uh, decompression. Went back in, um, trimmed uh, the subocciput as we talked about. This is the dura. This is the post-op. Uh, over decompression. Over decompression is disabling. Under decompression, if somebody comes in and they have an under decompression, fine. I go in and extend the surgery to what I think works. Okay. Over decompression is disabling to a lot of people, maybe not all. Uh, this is a young woman uh, studying a medical profession. She's a student. Uh, she gets a Chiari decompression. That's an over decompression. Um, but there's other reasons that this surgery failed. The dura was too expanded. This is what she comes in with. Now, she has gone back to her surgeon at a very top academic center in the US, and they told her, you're wide open. Uh, another opinion in the same city, 
you're wide open. She gets depressed for a year, works her way to Colorado. I said, you're wide open. But I said, if you don't mind, I'd like to touch that area. Oh, I don't let people touch that. So she allowed me, she traveled a long way. I gently put my fingers there and I gently gave a press and she went like that, okay? The headache was intense, the mother's eyes like that. For the first time in over a year, we now were starting to narrow down why this girl couldn't go back to school, couldn't drive, couldn't work. So I told her she's, she's just, she's too wide open. This is, this, her intracranial cavity, spinal fluid, is connected to the atmosphere only by skin, okay? And they don't want people to touch that area. She had a huge uh, duroplasty. I did a reduction duroplasty. Okay, uh, there were some uh, arachnoid bands, took care of those, uh, rebuilt, these are plates I designed about 13 years ago. I had the company make a larger plate for her. That is her post-op, and you'd think, well, wait a minute. She uh, went back to school, went back to work. I've uh, gotten her wedding announcement, and subsequently her two uh, births of two children. So being just right is important. Here's another over decompression. What happens to the cerebellum? Imagine, where's my pointer? Imagine the bone was there. So that cerebellum is slump. That's a cerebellar slump. The support has been given. And again, there's no muscular connection or protection to that area. So as I see these folks with uh, even bigger decompressions, and they're not doing well, then I ask the company I measure and then ask to customize a plate that will allow reconstruction so the muscle can reattach. Moving on. So that's management of the bone. Management of the dura. And this is about extradural decompression that we need to talk about, okay? She comes in, um, C1 decompression looks good. Um, C2 may be a little wide here. Um, but the key issue is they left the dura alone because that does lower risks. Lower risk. Well, on the other hand, those folks are often going to come to my office or other specialists' office. What happens is they do well for about six months because that, that dura is still, since the wound is not solid, that dura is responding to the cough and sneeze. Once all this tissue gets firm, as you can see, it actually narrowed it even further. So she's got her Chiari back because the dura was not opened. Uh, this is an intraoperative ultrasound, spinal cord, tonsils, the dura. There's no room behind the dura. And so that actually, to me, an extradural decompression is one of the more straightforward operations in the sense that um, we, we're completing the surgery, what I feel is we're completing the surgery. Now, uh, let me go here. I believe that in 14 years or older, uh, duroplasty is the best option if you keep your risks low, okay? Our CSF leak rate has been about 2% for many years, but that's using your own tissue and a variety of techniques. However, there is this important study that you've heard about or may have heard about out of Washington uh, University in St. Louis. They'll be the center, and there will be a randomized trial in younger people to see whether duroplasty is needed if you have a syrinx, okay? Uh, so we'll find that answer, hopefully, with this study. Now, if you're gonna open the arachnoid, some surgeons will do a duroplasty, and I've certainly done this before, and leave the arachnoid alone. If you've got less risk of CSF leak, a bit less risk of infection, okay? But if the surgeon makes a hole in the dura, that's when trouble can start. This is a woman who couldn't return to college. Uh, her surgeon said she's wide open. And the same thing, wide open, wide open. For surgeons, the key is to read that op note. And what the op note said when she was in my office is, the, ar the arachnoid was not open. So I have to be suspicious. I can't look at that and say, you're wide open. What I say is, let's do a cine, okay? And y'all know what that is. What is that? For those of you who have seen it, seen a scene, this is the spinal cord, cerebellum is up here. What is that? 
That is a subdural hygroma. It is water that traps between the hole. Here are two holes in her arachnoid. It got out. It expanded that area, so there's no flow. You've just got a trapped cyst. So look at your op note or have someone look at their op note if they've got ongoing symptoms. Was the arachnoid open or not? When I saw within this past month, a little hole was uh, in the arachnoid, but they still left it alone. It's a risk for a subdural hygroma. It's very treatable. You just get rid of all that arachnoid. Here's another one. That looks normal. That looks normal. But in certain views, that looked too white for me. It just seemed too white, okay? Uh, and this person is having all their symptoms. And so basically she had a leak and that's called a subdural hygroma. So let me move on. Um, what do you do with the tonsils? We'd rather not shrink them if we don't have to. But what are you gonna do with this young lady? Extremely long brain stem, very severe Chiari. It's very abnormal. Here is lying face down, the spine is in that direction, the head is up here. The taunt, you open that door and those tonsils want to come out of there. Kind of, hello, thank you, I've been needing some room. And I'm kind of going, no, no, no. <laughs> okay. So with patients, you can reduce and be judicious and safe. I don't want to get that vessel, so that's a stopping point. There's the fourth ventricle that's opened up, and this is a one-year outcome. And although we think of this as primarily a congenital disorder, why did that brain stem go from this to that, okay? A much more relaxed brain stem, because it's probably congenital, but it's activated during life. Is it that trauma? Is it that delivery? Is it just time? And that's another topic we won't belabor. Now this one is really, to me, very important because these folks really get bombed, if you will. They've got a syrinx. They have a Chiari decompression. It doesn't look unreasonable. Okay, I think I found a few adhesions. Uh, but the syrinx has done nothing. Okay, decompression, Chiari syrinx you can see that's a fairly severe syrinx. A few adhesions at surgery, that's not enough to explain that. Here's another, very few, but this is the ticket. Look at the op note, did they spread the tonsils apart and look at the outlet of the fourth ventricle called the foramen magendi. And so when folks like this come to me, I look at the op note, if there's no comment about the outlet, then I'm suspicious they didn't go after this congenital deformity that occurs in some people with syringomyelia, which is the, the veil over the drain hole, okay? So you spread that out, I hope you can see this, and then with a fine micro knife that certain neurosurgeons use, we open it up, and now you can see inside the fourth, I hope you can see it's open, this is a two month response from syrinx. And in this condition with a veil, that's not unreasonable. In other words, not all collapses quickly. But the reason this didn't improve is because the outlet was not checked. Okay? And again, these are things we're trying to teach just simply from the experience. Here's another veil over the fourth ventricle. Here's opened up, and you can see it nicely open. Here's one I just did a couple of months ago. I have her pictures. These are her pre-op, a young, healthy uh, woman. And you can see the syrinx. Oh, this. Oh, there we go. And um, and you can see a two-month follow-up. Okay. Um, so those are some of the steps. Um, and maybe I've gone too fast, but I can answer questions. Um, but some people come in with multiple causes. It's not just this and that. And so those take quite a bit of work to analyze. Here's uh, multiple causes, if you will. There's an, clearly an over decompression here. Too much bone, big duroplasty, and poor muscle coverage. The areas that I left out for you are, then I reconstruct with a titanium Chiari plate to get the muscle there. If the bone is very thin in the corners, there are a few people I can't put it on. You bow it out, people have asked, well, why are you putting things back on? Um, you bow the plate into an arc. So you're really enlarging that area, but you're giving uh, muscle support. Is it essential? No. Uh, why do I do it? 
Two reasons. Number one, it keeps people from having quite that sunken defect that they can have from these surgeries. But number two, we're born with this kind of neck, a gentle seat-shaped curve, okay? As we get older, we might straighten or we might reverse with degenerative changes. Why are we weakening this substructure here that's very important to having us balance our neck? So chronic pain we've seen from some of these folks is indeed this extensive loss of support. You saw some of those big, wide neuroplasties. The muscles aren't working there, okay? So we've got to close things up, give something for the muscle to attach to, and then really pull the wound together. Another thing that I didn't want to spend a whole lot of time is some people, in some, and I was an academic surgeon for uh, 21 years, you, it's not unreasonable to let the resident close the wound, the incision, okay? But my belief is that the primary surgeon who did that operation needs to be in the room. Because I have people come in and they say, it's this hole in the back of my head. And they've got this very sunken defect because there wasn't diligence, if you will, in closing the wound. So those are some of the steps I didn't bring to you uh, today. But let's look at this one again. Over decompression, but under decompression. They left C1 alone in this particular case. Sometimes you can, so they're still crowding. No report that they looked uh, at the outlet, so a persistent long searing. So there can be multiple issues going on here, three, in, three steps in particular, over, under, and uh, not seeing if there's an outlet problem. This is the most recent complex case I did. I'll finish up with this uh, case. This young man is 19, had an extra dural decompression, and um, failed that decompression after about two years. The academic partner in that uh, practice um, did a duroplasty procedure. Um, unfortunately, it blew out. And actually, in revision surgery, I could see the spinal fluid pumping through here. It blew out. Unfortunately, you need to jump on a pseudomeningocele early on, I believe, at least assess it early on. Don't let it sit around. Unfortunately, uh, this had leaked out through the skin. Unfortunately, meningitis. Unfortunately, six months of antibiotics. The first month or two, the mother getting up in the middle of the night to change the bags of antibiotics hanging. Very distressful. Uh, went back to the surgeon after the meningitis resolved. They put a shunt in, um, and that failed. Um, he eventually made his way uh, to, the, to uh, the medical center of Aurora, and uh, I know he was in the OR nine hours. I haven't looked at my time, probably about seven, seven and a half hours. Um, basically, um, Obviously, this drained out, opened this up, removed a lot of adhesions, went in and found a veil. Well, people ask me, why would you operate? You know, somebody says, gosh, you're going to go back in there. You'd rather not. This is a 19-year-old. His syrinx is now moving into his brainstem. What choice is there? You have to operate on him. Um, indeed, found a veil, and fortunately, uh, he's... Uh, at least while he's in the hospital, his vision is improving, his finger to nose on this hand, and the numbness in this hand is improving. I haven't followed him up yet. I have guarded outlook for him. We're all praying for him, actually. Uh, no calls from the family, so I'm hoping that's a good sign, and maybe in a few weeks we'll see him. Um, so um, this is, in my view, Create your principles, stick to your principles as to what works. This is a learning process over 20 years. My mission is to share some of this with the, with the team, to make others aware, um, so you know the right questions to ask if your syrinx is still there. Did you look at the outlet of the foramen magnum? It usually should be in the op note. Uh, keep us on point, so to speak. Uh, and let's work together. If I wrote about my views on Chiari surgery in a special issue that was solely devoted to Chiari malformation back in 2011. Um, I need to update this, obviously, but I think this reflects quite a bit of what we think. Um, and then just if you want to reach us, 
Um, go to your iPhone or your Android and just Kiari, you can get a Kiari app. This is um, just an information app, the contact, maps, etc. But our real project is the next app. It's taking a little time. Once a person is uh, uh, scheduled surgery, they get a code and they'll get another app. That app will audit, once the date is selected, that'll automatically uh, send them notifications like it's five days before your surgery, you need to start your HIPAA showers or it's seven days, you need to stop your uh, anticoagulants. There are about 30 alerts. Um, and uh, we hopefully, as we go along, we'll be able to communicate uh, th with patients through that app. Um, and it's an ongoing project. And with that, thank you.